Okay, well, welcome everybody. I've got a number of things that I want to talk to you about and show you, but very much this is based on my guess of what I think you might want to know. Uh, I'm planning on giving you a bit of an introduction to Roehampton University and the business school within it, and then focusing mostly on the courses that are available to you through Aventis. Um, and I've got some other material that I can share with you just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what uh, a lecture might look like or a part of a lecture might look like. But I kind of feel that's less important than addressing your specific questions, and giving you the information that's directly relevant to you being able to make a more confident choice about whether you want to uh, join one of our programs or not. And that's really what I want to try and cover today. Uh, I myself... Uh, as you can see on the screen, my title is now Head of Collaborative Partnerships. So before I move on, let me just explain a little bit more about what I do and who I am. I have I come from an industry background, as uh, Ling Ling's already mentioned. She's, she, she got hold of some of my CV from somewhere. Uh, yes, I come from an industry background. My first degree many, many, many years ago was actually in electronics. So I come from a technical background. But as I was doing my first degree in electronics, I very quickly realized that the parts of the course that interested me most was not understanding how things worked. For me, the bit of my course that I did at university that interested me most was the stuff where we said, well, we know it works like this. Why do we care? And what difference does it make? So I quickly became more interested in the application of technology to real needs, to issues, to business opportunities. And as a result, when I graduated, I actually went straight into IBM, at the time the world's largest computing organization, about a quarter of a million people worldwide. I went straight into IBM in a sales and marketing role. And I spent six years with them. So that was my first job, being trained by, at the time, arguably the best in the business. And I had a very client-focused Job. So I spent a lot of my time with big corporate customers and some smaller ones, helping them understand how to use computing technology better. And I was doing that job with IBM until 1995. In 1995, I had an opportunity to move to a small consultancy that was right on the leading edge of research into the new wave of IT. And at the time I made that move, the idea of individuals owning personal computers in houses was in their houses was just becoming an important story. And those personal computers had CD-ROM drives in them. And 95, 96 was really the time when, for those of us right at the heart of the industry, the internet first appeared on the radar for us. Before then, none of us had heard of it. So I was involved in specialist research and consultancy activity looking at the future of technology in the home in particular. And I remember, for example, giving a presentation to the board of directors of Lloyds Bank in London, one of the most famous and most important banks in the world. They were having a technology away day hosted by IBM. And I had a half an hour presentation where I started talking to them about this, telling them about the idea of people doing banking from devices in their homes and I was laughed out of the building. Think about that. I was right. Those very, very highly paid executives completely missed the point. I had a similar experience with the board of Peugeot Citroen in Paris where I was starting to tell them that the technology was lining up that meant people would buy cars remotely and they said, don't be ridiculous. So, I have quite an interesting career background because after that, I then went and worked for British Telecom. I worked for a number of large and small IT companies, but all of my work was very much focused around the latest thing. What was the leading edge, or we used to call it the bleeding edge of technology, where it was really new stuff. The problem is, in 2001, we had the issue with 9-11 in New York and the Twin Towers. And that decimated the industry. And suddenly nobody was interested in new technology because they were scared. And the economies of the world shrank. 
And all everybody wanted to do was look at what was safe. What have they always done? What could they rely on? And as a result, my position and work in that kind of aspect of the industry became impossible to find. And the rest of the story is history, really, because I gradually transitioned over to higher education. And I found in the world of higher education, I already knew a lot of stuff that was very useful to students. And I hadn't realized that. And I did a master's degree uh, later in life as an adult, some 10 years ago, uh, as, a, as an older adult, sorry, not as an, as an older adult. Um, so I've transitioned into higher education from industry. And I know, and I say all of this because I want you to understand that I know that many of you have already got jobs and have got professional background and professional experience. And I've seen some of your uh, resumes, some of your CVs for those that are applying for starting now. And I've seen that some of you have got tremendous work experience. But I just want to say to you, I was like you. I came and did a master's degree having got a lot of experience, but perhaps was a bit vulnerable academically. I was worried. Would I cope? And what I found was the sheer amount of experience I had made a huge difference to the way I approached study. It wasn't as hard as I expected. It was okay. It was almost fun. So as we talk today, I want to start by saying, I understand where some of you are coming from and I get it. And I want to, as far as I'm able to, to say to you with some confidence, you can do this. Okay, you can do this. And many of our master's programs are designed around and are taken by people who've got a lot of career experience. If you are somebody who doesn't have much career experience, don't panic because we don't assume lots of prior knowledge for these masters. We don't insist that you've already got highly specific subject knowledge. Okay. So without further ado, let me move forward a little bit and I'll jump through a lot of these slides very quickly. I have far more material than I'm going to use. I promise you. So don't panic, especially those of you in Aventis who already know how many slides I've got. I will whip through a lot of these or ignore them completely. So Roehampton University is on the edge of London, southwest, inside Southwest London. If you're interested in tennis and you're watching the Wimbledon tennis finals at the moment, Roehampton University is probably only about three or four miles from Wimbledon. Okay, it's very close. Uh, and from one of, one of our buildings, we can also see Wembley. So actually, tonight, European football championships, probably not that much interest to most of you. The European football final in Wembley, I would be able to see the stadium from the university. So we are in the heart of southwest London, just a few miles from the very centre of London with a really lovely green campus and the building you can see in the bottom left of your screen, the modern brick building, that is the business school where I am based. Okay. So if I can now wake my mouse up and make this work, I'm trying to advance the, I'm trying to advance the slides and fading. Right. There you go. So our campus, I'll show you a few, few, few photographs. This is one of the main buildings. This is the old building at the top of the campus where all the most important people sit and pontificate. Um, the university is formed of four colleges that came together in the past. Um, so we're quite spread out on a large green leafy campus. This is our this is our pride and joy. This photograph in the middle, this is the centre of our new library that was only built a couple of years ago. And we're very proud of this. Um, it's a lovely space to work and it's been a huge investment for the university. It's worth every penny. And the other photographs are just a variety of typical shots that you might see around campus. Some buildings, of course, are better than others. That's inevitable. But that's the environment that we have here. And of course, if you're staying in Singapore, none of this is that relevant to you. However, if you're in the UK, you are always welcome to visit and we can always show you around. Now, let's think a little bit about the world we now live in. You see, what we realise as a business school within the campus is that the world of work is changing enormously. Now, these are somewhat UK-centric, some of these photographs, but let's think briefly about this. Have a look at these photographs. Um, top right for you, Netflix. Well, I, rem I am old enough to remember video cassette recorders. Maybe some of you are as well. Um, and I remember buying my first video cassette recorder. I remember having one in the house. They were expensive. They were unreliable. The picture quality wasn't very good. But now what are we doing? We all watch movies, shows via streaming services such as Netflix. A massive change in the way that media is distributed, streamed, 
high speed connections. And of course, in Singapore, you have some of the best high speed networks in the world. Streams to your home, streams to your phone. I've never got into watching movies on my phone. I don't get it. It's not what I do. But I'm a bit older. My kids do it. Bottom right, Alexa and other devices. The whole idea of, of connections in your home, always on, always monitoring, always available to do things for you. What about retail? Um, the reason we have uh, two shops there, top left, Debenhams and ASOS. I don't know if those. I I don't know if those names mean much to you. Debenhams is a big UK high street um, department store, and it's just gone into receivership. It's closed all its stores after I don't know how many years, many years. Um, but it's closed its stores and given up because fashion, in particular, is now dominated by online stores such as ASOS that have been very very successful. And I think the COVID-19 outbreak and the problems that it caused around the world have made some of these online retailers even more successful. And then we have changes in technology, the move from diesel and petrol cars to electric, that hence the picture of Tesla, is a huge change. So what is happening in the world of work is that work and business opportunity is being impacted by changes in technology and change, corresponding changes in behavior. What about this? Masks. Now, in fact, I can see that not everybody's wearing masks in that picture. This picture was taken before mask, became, mask wearing became mandatory. But look behind at the, at the for rent sign, prime retail unit. I can go down my local high street and I can see enormous numbers of retail spaces not in use anymore. I walked past an empty one yesterday just in my local small town. There is a problem right now in the UK and a number of other parts of the world where physical stores cannot afford to exist anymore. And again, the COVID outbreak has made that a lot worse. So we know that the world around us is changing. The nature of work is changing. How we work, where we work is changing. What we do is changing. So the world of business is very, very fast moving and dynamic. And the important point here is that we try and keep our courses up to date. We review the content every year. We have major review points every three years where we consider fundamental redesign where necessary. Um, I can't see all my screen here. So, of course, um, Roehampton's, in, Roehampton's on the edge of London, one of the world's great cities and financial centres, um, a very, very important place for global business. That's our building. Um, let me go on. Right. A few key points here, and I'm going to skip through some of these fairly fast um, because some of it won't matter to you or mean anything to you. What do business schools need to do? They need to teach you and teach you well, and they need people who are experienced and know the right stuff. But equally, we, for example, are a business school with a social conscience. Now, that's easy to say. It's harder to do. We have embedded business ethics as a core subject within our undergraduate curriculum. Everybody has to take it. That's crucial. We see behaving correctly in the world of business, understanding the choices that you make in business and making the right choices, we see those as absolutely fundamental to the mission we have to teach people. We have a lot of accreditation with external organizations. Now, I'm not going to talk much about that with you because most of that applies to people studying in the UK. There are different accreditation options and professional body memberships available through various partners, but it gets more complicated when partner organizations like Aventis deliver our materials elsewhere in the world. What, what I guess is the point here is that our courses, both undergraduate and postgraduate, have been reviewed and evaluated by organizations such as the Chartered Management Institute, the Chartered Institute of Professional Development, an institute of marketing, organizations like that that are, that are uh, professional bodies set up for the purposes of supporting others in that profession. And they have reviewed our courses and rubber stamped them. They've said, yeah, these are good. We like them. Um, many, of, many of my colleagues 
like me, have a lot of professional business skills and work experience that we bring to the classroom. We don't just bring it to the classroom. We bring it to our course design. That's really important. Our courses are not just designed out of a dusty textbook. They're designed and written by people who've done it, who've seen it, who've experienced it, and have got the scars to prove it. We do have a number of academics who do a lot of uh, important research. So we have uh, world-class research that also informs our courses and our teaching. Um, study abroad isn't relevant to you because that's something we particularly offer our undergraduates. Um, the library you may never see if you never come to the UK, although you have electronic access to many of its resources. Um, again, it's complicated when we work with partners because partners like Aventis have their own uh, library facilities and things like this. Uh, so again, I won't speak much about that for now. Okay, um, I've mentioned this already. Um, and the reason, apart from the ethics teaching point, um, we also uh, do a lot of research work in that. And and these are examples of some of the research carried out by uh, some of our staff uh, in relation to um, social conscience, ethics, um, corporate accountability and things like that. So let's talk a bit about you guys. Sorry, I'm just going to take a quick sip of my tea, which is now cold. Never mind. Let's talk a little bit about you guys. Um, what are you looking at studying? So these are the master's degree courses that are available from Roehampton University through Aventis. I'm not going to spend a long time talking about how partnerships work, but in really simple terms, think of it like a franchise relationship. Think of it as though Aventis, Aventis is going to teach you. That's, that's the way this works. They will be responsible for your day-to-day -day student experience. However, they're not going to teach you from their own courses. They are going to use our courses, our materials, our assignments, our study guides, our study plans, our schedules. They are going to take everything that we've created for our own students and they are going to act as a channel to you for that same stuff. Now, because of the way Aventis is choosing to offer this in block mode over weekends and things like this, the actual order they teach you stuff might be a little bit different. But the intention is that as closely as possible, you get the same student study experience as you would get if you were with us directly in London. There will obviously be some changes. That's inevitable. But those are practical changes. And any significant changes, we have to authorise. Now, we do allow for some small changes uh, that are localising, uh, that, that, that allow for a localization of the course. So I might... For example, in my project management course, in my project management module, I might use an example from the UK. I might talk to my students about a building in London, for example. I might talk about the project to build the Shard, the Gherkin, as an example. Well, maybe for delivery of the same course by Aventis, there may be a local construction project in Singapore, that's a more appropriate example for all of you. That's completely acceptable to us. We understand that. The assignment work that we set across the courses will sometimes involve case studies and localized examples. And again, we give authority to our partners to make minor changes to say, actually, we're going to set the same questions. We're going to insist on the same subjects being covered but we'd like to use a different case study as our assignment case study. And again, we authorize that, but obviously we have to approve it. So what I want you to understand as we look at these courses is it is a set of Roehampton courses delivered by Aventis on our behalf. And you, of course, when you pass it, get a Roehampton University London uh, postgraduate degree. OK, so here are the four. The MBA, these are not in a particular order. They're in the order I typed them in that came off a spreadsheet I've got. It's as simple as that. An MBA, Master's in Business Administration, the, and then three different MSCs. They all have the word global in them, and that's deliberate because we want to emphasize that these courses are intended to have an international flavor. They are not intended to be UK-specific courses. They have an international flavor. They are looking at the world of work not just the local. 
work environment and business, the world of business. So three global MSCs, one focusing on HRM, human resources management, one focusing on financial management and one focusing on marketing. So one's about people, one's about money and one's about whatever marketing's about. We always joke, by the way, marketing people are the ones who do coloring in. Accountants are the ones who count things. Okay. Um, that's, you know, and um, HR, human resource management people, there's all sorts of jokes about HR people. In fact, there's jokes about every kind of business person. I could spend a long time on them and I won't. Okay. Uh, and project managers, of course, those are the people who get up in the morning and write a to-do list. And the first thing on their to-do list is write a to-do list. So they write that, write the rest of the to-do list, and then cross the first thing on the list off and feel good about themselves. That's what project managers do. Okay, let's move on. So I've got two slides coming up, two slides coming up with these four courses listed, and I've broken each one down by module. So you can see the, sub, the, sub, the subjects within it, and there's a reason for the color coding. So here's the first two, MBA and Global HRM. So if you study the MBA, you will study the following modules, separate discrete modules. Okay, the ones in blue are common to all of these four postgraduate degrees. So you can see the differences by looking at the black text. So there are subtle differences. So you can see in the MBA, for example, is a project management module. It's actually now called advanced project management, that module, but never mind. There's a project management module. Whereas in the global HRM course, it's not there. Instead, you have something called managing across borders, which is all about managing internationally. But you can see that both of these degrees do include financial performance management and leadership and change management. And, if, and, um, and although both of them include HR business partnering, you'll see on the next slide that I think some of the other courses don't, which is why, which is why they're not in blue. They all have dissertations. I'll talk about that separately in a minute. So let me put the next slide up. And you can see the other two courses. There you go. So here we have global financial management. And again, business research methods and dissertation, top and tail it. Again, strategic marketing is in there because even financial people need to understand marketing because they'll have to pay for it. But then global financial management includes global strategic management, international corporate finance, and strategic investment appraisal. I think that's probably the most mathematical of all of them. And although it's strategic, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of um, monetized risk analysis in that model. Net present value calculations and, and, uh, uh, and all those kinds of things. Running spreadsheets, seeing what the results are. Global marketing, anything but, okay? Marketeers don't like numbers they like coloring in and pretty pictures and, and and symbols and icons so you have global strategic management digital marketing practice so so very much an up-to-date module focusing on 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 marketing in the digital world um, and global brand management you know our, one of the things we do when on some of our open days with some of our undergraduates potential undergraduates who are sort of 17 or 18 when they come to to, to have an open day is we put simple icons on the screen we display a simple a symbol and ask them what the company is. And a lot of those icons, a lot of those images are very, very, very simple. I'm just looking around to see what I've got in hand that I can easily show you myself. Well, I mean, you can probably see behind me, because I'm a car guy, very famous. I and mean, I know it says Ferrari underneath. It doesn't need to. Most people know that's Ferrari. Okay? There are so many. The Apple symbol. All those icons you have on your phones now, these are brands, okay? Three-pointed star, I keep stick with cars, three-pointed star, the Mercedes. Um, there are so many brands. Amazon has got a new icon on it. My, my icon for Amazon changed recently on my phone, and I don't like it. Amazon thinks it's good. It doesn't work for me, but corporate colors, the re colors that represent specific organizations. I mean, we could go on, but global brand management is all about how do you take a famous brand and manage it in a global context? So the emphasis on 
internationalization is really important. So let me just go back up again. So there's your first slide. The MBA and the HRM course. And I'm just giving you a chance to look at those. And then the second one is this one again. Now, one of the things that um, matters here for us on our own campus, of course, is that we deliver quite a lot of these modules in larger groups. So if strategic marketing is taught to all of these courses, then we can have all the students together. How Aventis does this is up to them. So it may well be that for some of the time you are sharing your um, class time with people from some of these other courses. It may be that sometimes you're not. OK, um, so. You'll need to talk to Aventis to understand more about how that will work. The good news is if you're sharing class time with others from other courses, you get a slightly wider experience. So finance people, if you're doing strategic marketing with the global marketing people, actually, you'll probably learn from them. That will be helpful to you. So the cross correlation across student groups can actually be quite a positive experience. OK. You probably want to know this slide. I, my experience of potential students is they always want to know about this. How will we assess you? Well, there's a range of ways, and I'm not going to be that specific today, I'm afraid, but I'm going to tell you what typically happens because it will vary from module to module. Some assessments will be individual, and there may be some work that you do in groups. We try not to make group assessments at this level, uh, a dominant way of doing things. Um, it's not fair. Sometimes it means that weak students do rather well and strong students feel they've carried the weak students. So we're very careful about group assessments, but that doesn't mean there's none. Um, you might be asked to write a report. You might be asked to write an essay. You might be asked to write some sort of research paper that uses a lot of established literature that you then would find and review and comment on. You may even be asked to make a podcast, or build a blog. Um, usually, we now work on the basis of two assessments per module. They vary in terms of their weighting. So I don't. So I'm going to give you an example from my module, but this is not necessarily always the case for every module. So for my advanced project management assignment, I ask for two discrete assessments to be submitted and you can see on the screen what they are um, typically i ask for the first assessment to be about 1500 words which isn't enormous in fact the problem is keeping it small enough students find it easy to write more actually um, for 1500 words and it's and it's a literature review and an, uh, with analysis and recommendations and what i ask students to do is pick a subtopic within project management such as risk management or project teams management or project communications, those sorts of subtopics. And I ask them to find uh, two or possibly three uh, key pieces of academic literature that have been written about that. So you might find three research papers looking at the issue of risk management in projects. And I ask you to compare and contrast those three um, analyze the differences and use them to make recommendations about project management in, in an international context. Um, it, is, it is a very different type of piece of work to the kind of work where we've spent 10 weeks telling you something and your job is to tell it, report it back to us. That's not how we test you. If, I, if you come from the kind of learning environment uh, and, I, and I don't know much about the Singapore education system, so forgive me. But if you come from the kind of learning environment, which we call very didactic, you sit there, you're told lots of stuff and your job is to repeat it back. This is not like that. You are expected to have an opinion. You're expected to express your opinion and you're marked, you will be marked on the basis of how well you justify and argue your opinion, not necessarily whether we actually agree with you or not. The second assignment that I set is a case study report. We ask you to pick a <coughs> pick a, uh, a, a, a case study, a, a real case of project management in action. 
We give you specific lists to choose from. That list will be localized for eventist delivery and, and for, for the reasons I already talked about. But you are free to pick your own project example as long as you agree it with your lecturing staff beforehand. Because you might, for example, know a project very well that you've worked on, and we might not know about it. So in principle, you could use that as your case study, but we have to be confident that it has the right kind of learning that can be brought from it and that it's well documented. Because if the only documentation available about it is private within a private company and is not available for public viewing, we can't use it because we can't even check whether it's true or not. You might have made it all up. So we have to be sure, excuse me, that the case that you are using works. So that's how I set the assignment for project management. It will vary from module to module completely. Um, I can't say much more about it than that. And as you can see from the screen, we, we've got a weighting on those two assignments, 40% for the first and 60% for the second one. Uh, overall pass is required. So in theory, you could ignore the first one completely, do insanely brilliantly on the second one and get 85, 90% on it. And you'd still and you'd still pass the course overall because we have a 50% pass mark for the course. You do not need to pass individual components you need to pass each module overall. So we build into our assessments where possible scope for your own creative thinking and focus on personal interest and experience. So like using like using a case study that you know about, like picking a subtopic within project management that you're particularly interested in. That's typical of what we do. Um, right. I've already talked for half an hour and gone. I'm trying to think what the right thing to cover is next. Here's where we're aiming for. This is actually a photograph of some of our undergraduates. So some of you will be a bit older, but the principle is the same. We want you to get to a point where, whether physically or virtually, you can wear a silly outfit that looks a little bit like something out of Harry Potter and perhaps have a celebration event with your families and go, look what I did. I did it. I actually did it. That's where we're aiming for, for all of you. Um, we say this to our students visiting us on campus, but I'm going to say it to you as well. As far as possible, working with Aventis, this is still true. OK, we will encourage and support you. We want to do that. And I'm sure the Aventis staff will do the same. We want to do everything to give you a chance to succeed and fulfill your potential. To show the world what you can do, to get that extra master's degree to get that qualification that moves you further up the career ladder, that um, helps establish your academic credibility. I've seen CVs of some of you who, who've got um, poor first degrees or occasionally not one at all, but you've got so much professional experience. We are really happy to take you in certain instances. And actually, this is an opportunity for you to... Um, Ignore your first degree or the fact that you didn't get one and show the world, look, I can do this. I can succeed academically. And we want to help you do that as far as we possibly can. Um, but it works both ways. You see, for us to do that, we expect something of you, don't we? We, Roehampton and Aventis, we expect for you to be committed. We expect you to engage with us. We expect you to be there. We expect you to talk. We expect you to have an opinion. We expect you to challenge. I want my students in my classroom to say, <coughs> excuse me, Tim, I don't understand. Surely you're not right. I, my experience is different to what you've said. That's great. I love it when students do that because it means we can enter into a debate and a discussion. That's what we want. And, of course, hard work. OK, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, because I have got some stuff here about a portion of a lecture. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to skip that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into. Sorry, I'm ignoring all of this. I can go back to it if I need to, but I want to go to something at the end. We include project management as a topic on the MBA. Because we think it's particularly important for MBA. 
And we also include a simple, more basic version in our undergraduate degrees. And the reason we do so is because when we went out to industry leaders a few years ago and said, what do you need our students to know? One of the things they said was we want them to talk the language of projects. And I say to my undergraduate students in particular, project management is all around you and you don't realize it. And then I show them this slide. Um, these are examples of projects, ladies and gentlemen. And I just want you to think about that for a moment. Because project management is an example of a, of, of a business domain that's also applicable in personal life. So why are these pictures? Well, the middle one is the middle one perhaps is fairly obvious. I mean, there's the European football championship going on in Europe and final at Wembley on uh, tomorrow night. Um, but it's an event. And managing an event is a kind of project. So those of you that are particularly interested in project management, the MBA may be a particularly good choice for you because we do a project management module. Events management is a kind of project. Setting it up, working out who are the participants, ensuring that everything is in place uh, is, is a crucial aspect of project management. Think about the Olympics. We had the Olympics in London in 2012. It's coming to Tokyo, of course, a year late, but um, with lots of concerns about the reality of that. But, but you can't afford to be late with the Olympics. You can't afford to turn around and go, oh, sorry, we're not quite ready. Could we start two weeks later, please? Everything has to be ready. Whereas, top right, building an extension on a house, you can slip it by two weeks. And actually, if you're the homeowner paying for this to be built, cost is probably more important than absolute timescales. So whereas with events, timescales are everything, with things like construction, timescales can slip, whereas cost might be everything. I've got this amount of money available and I need to create this extra room in my house and I can't spend more. If it takes a few weeks longer, never mind, but that is my budget. So construction is a key field for project managers, um, both at a small scale level and, of course, the massive stuff. Um, I wish we could have an interactive discussion about this, really. Top left, the car. Why would I put that up there? Well, I'll tell you why. That's mine, that car. I spent five years rebuilding it. Um, in fact, it is... The other side of this wall, it is actually literally a meter away from me. Um, and I spent five years rebuilding that. Time didn't matter. It was as long as it took. Budget, mm, within reason, but it was going to cost what it cost over a length of time. The issue was resources. What did I have available? What skills did I have? Where did I have to take it to get other things done? I can do a lot of mechanical work. I rebuilt the engine. I installed, I did all the mechanical work, completely stripped it. Um, but I'm not an upholsterer. I don't use sewing machines. So when I had the seats covered in leather and I had all of that reupholstered, I had to pay somebody to do it. I had to find external suppliers. I had to do the same for the bodywork. I, I don't have a spray booth, so I had to pay somebody to repaint it. I had to source parts, some of which were very difficult to get. It's a project. What about the bottom three? Just quickly, bottom left, a show. A, another kind of event, putting on a stage play, a musical, is a project. How long have we got? Where is it going to start? What money have we got available? How many actors and actresses can we afford? What kind of stage props do we need? How many musicians? How many tickets can we sell? Do the finances work? It's all part of project management. Bottom right. No, I stick with the middle. Middle. So it's a bit like construction. Painting your room. Maybe you've done that. Maybe you've taken your bedroom and repainted it sometimes. Maybe you said, perhaps years ago, to your parents, I don't like the colour of my room. It's too babyish. I want it different. Maybe you got the paint out and did it yourself. It's a project. It might be a small project, but it's still a project. It still has costs. It still has timescale implications, resources required, certain things that have to be done in certain orders. You can't paint it all until you've prepped it and sanded it. And then bottom right, um, something close to my own children's hearts because they're both, um, well, one's left university, one's just in their, about to go into their final year. Both of them, before they went to university, travelled the world. Travelling can, can be a project. So travelling around the world for six months, which is what both of my kids did, was a complex undertaking and it took a while. So they had to plan it out, work out where they were going to go. None of them came to Singapore, by the way, but they did go to Thailand uh cambodia my daughter went to laos and they both went to vietnam as well so 
they came towards that part of the world. Um, it's a project. So the reason I put this slide up is I want to try and connect the real world with the business world. And we do that in as many of our courses as possible. So with that in mind and being aware of the time, I think I need to stop. We know this is what you're aiming for. This is what our graduation ceremonies in London look like. Hey, okay, big halls, silly costumes, silly hats, lots of champagne, things like that. I think we're pretty much done. Thank you very much.